Hi, everyone. I just want to say first, thank you for being here and taking the time out of your busy days and weeks to do something that I think is incredibly important, which we're going to talk a lot about today. And it's actually the first word on the screen, which is learn. As we pulled together this keynote, it, was, it almost became a theory of change in terms of what we came up with and this idea of learning, experimenting, and innovating. And so we're going to talk about that today. I just want to say th thank you to Mark. Can everybody give Mark a huge round of applause for putting this together? What I'm finding with the work that we do, not just in the US, but across the world, is that it takes early adopters and people that really care about this work, like Mark, to bring people together to learn about this transformational technology. So thank you, Mark. Um, as we were talking about, I am a former teacher, and I will teacher it today in the sense of I would love you guys to be engaged as much as possible. Um, really trying to, to stick with me. Hopefully, it'll be engaging. But this is an opportunity for us to level set and start really thinking about how we build our AI literacy and bring that back to your context. So I'm going to start with, if I can get the technology to work. That is not the way to use technology. Maybe if ChatGPT was here, he'd help me out. Um, so I want to start with the history of AI. And if you were in our earlier session, which was a 101, we looked at this uh, image. And the reason why I want to do this is that AI is actually not new. And so AI has been around since the 1950s. And it's been this idea, even back to like Socrates, of having non-humans do human-like things. And so artificial intelligence really came to be in about the 1950s. And it started with you know, some really simple pieces. And in fact, the first chatbot was named Eliza in 1964. And she was a mental health chatbot. And what they found is that people really did like being able to talk to a bot about their you know, health and well-being, but it wasn't very good. And if you used like an Amazon chatbot two years ago where you got stuck in a death loop of never getting to a representative, you had that same experience. But what's happened is we've had a real advancement of the technology. If we go down, so we had machine learning, so if you use predictive text, Siri, you know, this idea of teaching a, a, essentially an algorithm or a computer program with a lot of data to do something, like predict your next word. So that was part of our lives very significantly. In fact, if you have a cell phone, who's got a cell phone in here? You might be on it right now if I'm already boring is that if you have a cell phone or you have a laptop, you are interacting with artificial intelligence every day. And in fact, 84% of us across the entire world use AI every day. And in a lot of ways, we have no idea it's being used. So that's machine learning. And then what we moved into is this idea of the brain works really great at thinking. And we want to have human-like interactions. Then let's look at the brain. And so deep learning is a field in which we start looking at creating significantly more complex programs that can do things like generate new text, audio, images, coding, and video. And that's where we end up today. So everything we're talking about today is generative AI. So we think about ChatGPT, or if you're a student, maybe use Character AI or my Snapchat AI. You know, those are going to be examples of generative AI. And so that's what we're really focusing on. So I don't know if anybody's seen this, but it's a really great example of like the ways in which we suddenly have started talking about AI. Because what you see is from 1998, things like handwriting recognition and speech recognition were two places that we spent a lot of time on, you know, t decades trying to figure out. And so we see that it took quite a long time to get to a place where we were more, than, more equal or better to humans. Things like image recognition, reading comprehension, but you see that last bit See how tight it is and how like, it's like a de direct up. Because what we're seeing is that the technology itself has advanced at an astonishing rate. So the compute power that's behind things like generative AI went from 2018 to 2020 that if I was flying from London to New York City, it would usually take me eight hours. Between those two years, it would take me 19 seconds. So we're talking about an enormous, enormous transformation where the technology is going faster and faster, and we're things, seeing things like reading comprehension, uh, more and more around high school and college subjects. So we're going to see that this is why, all of a sudden, it's, less, it's just over a year today that we have ChatGPT coming into the world and why it has made such a big splash. And I know if you, came, you were at the earlier session, you know that ChatGPT is the fastest growing consumer technology ever. And I don't know, does anybody remember Facebook the first year? Was it very good? No. Your iPhone and iPod, 
New technologies are usually not very good at the very beginning. So that's something we're going to talk about a lot today. Even though hundreds of millions of people use generative AI every day, this technology is at its earliest state. It is the worst it will ever be today, the worst it will ever be tomorrow. And so even though it is astonishing how quickly and how amazing it can do, one of my favorite things is it might be pretty good at writing a five-paragraph essay. Apologies to English teachers everywhere, including Joe, who's going to be on our panel in a bit. But you know what it can't do? Word count. It doesn't do math. So ChatGPT, can, you can make it tell you 2 plus 2 equals 5. Because that's not what these tools are. They're not thinking. These are, are models that are computing and using probabilities. And if it says 2 plus 2 equals 4, it's saying that because in its training, it usually says 2 plus 2 equals 4. But if you trained it to say 2 plus 2 equals 5, it will give you 5. So here is one of our images. So this was our, our ode to chat GPT in education. So this is on our website if you'd like to see it. But it's been a pretty complex year. And so you want to kind of identify, you know, we've got chat GPT being released last November. Chat GPT 4 is in March. So does anybody in here use Conmigo, have ever used it, or with your students? Very few, but Conmigo is going to be, I would call it a homework helper. It was launched the day after ChatGPT 4, and that's one of the reasons why it's actually not very good yet, is because it was really based on the technology the same way that ChatGPT 4 wasn't very good yet. And so we see all of these pieces. We see that Harvard announces a chatbot that's going to help teach computer science in June. Uh, we actually see, so I know that we talk about A detection, I uh, hate to break it to everybody, there is no watermark or silver bullet that's going to tell you if something is AI generated. And in fact, OpenAI, who built ChatGPT, actually had an AI detection tool. And you know what they did? They turned it off because it was really bad at it. So ChatGPT did not know what it wrote. So this is something to consider. And there are still no foolproof methods to be able to see what's AI generated or not. And so we have this here because we see that a lot of the work this year has been trying to figure out what this means for education. And so we're really going to focus on what the actual impact is, which is pretty exciting. And we're going to see if I can get the technology to work um, of actual uh, generative AI on industry. So everyone in here is pretty much an educator or a student or a leader. Our whole goal is to make sure that the students that we're going to talk about today, so we have Charlie and Nho, are going to be part of our amazing panel after I speak, is to make sure that they are ready for careers and are leading like quality, happy lives, right? And so we can't ignore the impact of generative AI outside of these walls, outside of the schools, right? And one of the things I say all the time to leaders is that this is not a school problem. Like adoption of AI and like figuring it out is not a school problem, it's a world problem. And sometimes we can be pretty difficult to adopt because we have a lot of infrastructure needs, can be pretty difficult to make change, but this is actually happening across every industry in the world. And what we see is that even back in July, one third of all companies had already started integrating AI in a lot of different ways, usually internally first, because that's going to be a little bit more trustworthy. And that next is that there was a, about 40% of people really thought this is going to have a significant impact on industry as a whole. And so we're seeing that more and more. And finally, that up to 60% of tasks could be automated. And in some cases, almost completely. And what we also see is that between 70 and 80% of jobs that are at risk of being automated out are actually held by women and people of color. So it's something to consider. We're going to talk about, we can, I'm sure you've had other conversations. If you're going to join me later, we talk about policy. We'll always talk about equity. We'll always talk about diversity and making sure access is there. But there are, there are some real changes that are coming. But there are first, something around augmentation. How do we you know, collapse the time it takes you to lesson plan or a lawyer to do case study briefs, or a doctor to look at a, you know, one of the biggest ones right now is radiology. Uh, ChatGPT and other bots are as good, if not better, and much quicker than radiologists at looking at x-rays. So these are things that we're going to see. But more and more, we're seeing that this is being accepted into our industry. And in fact, the world will be vastly different. So does anybody in here teach kindergartners? Anybody teach littles? OK. One, thank you, there you go. It's a hard job, it's a fun job. Is that, you know, her students are going to graduate in 2036. Now let that sit. 2036. Think about the last year, <laughs> okay? And now we're talking about the future. And the future is going to be incredibly different. So a lot of what we need to do right now is start to embrace this technology in, in meaningful ways because we can't wait. 
because the world is not waiting, and the deaf industry is not, and so we can't either. The next thing is, okay, wait, I'm start. Who in here thinks that their kids use ChatGPT to cheat? Let's be honest. Oh, man. Okay. Uh, that is uh, by far the number one rhetoric about AI right now in educators is that AI is for cheating. And I would love for you all to come out of this day, and I know that Mark would as well, is that we move past that rhetoric as the only thing we're talking about. And I have to br hate to break it to you. Whoops. Come on, technology. There we go. This is a recent study that shows that students actually use it for their mental health and well-being more than they use it for schoolwork. So things like character AI. Has anybody heard of character AI? Okay, it is 18 million chatbots that have that you can a kid can keep about two hours daily average. It's the most second most popular Gen AI tool for kids under 18. Um, it is a friend. You can even have a group chat where you can have friends talking to bots. It's a little confusing. Um, but what we see is that actually these, are, these tools are significantly more complex. In fact, the number one AI tool used by young people, does anybody have a guess? If you're in my earlier session, you know this one. Snapchat AI. The first native AI in any social media was Snapchat, like months ago. There's a recent study from the UK that says that 79% of online seven to 17 year olds have used Snapchat AI. 40% between seven and 12, okay? And these are gonna be powered by ChatGBT and so have the same limitations and capabilities. So if we think that we can wait to start thinking about AI literacy, we can't. Okay, does anybody feel like this? This is actually really funny. So Dan, my co-founder, I want to say hi, Dan. He's taking video. Uh, we were like, okay, how do we show that there's like a lot going on? And then I turned to the screen and I was like, yeah, that does it. <laughs> this is what it feels like. Like every day there is something new. Every day, right? And how do you keep up? Like how do you keep up when you have, you know, you've got kids and teaching and administrative stuff, if you're a leader, if you're a family, like whatever you have, but it is very, very difficult to keep up. And so what I, the first thing I want to say is you do not need to be an expert. No one in here needs to leave here and try to be an AI expert. I will be honest, most people that are in AI are not experts on their own technology. In fact, these are black box models. One of my favorite things is anybody ever use Claude? It's a cons constitutional AI that is about second as good to ChatGPT. And if you ever see their CEO talking about their technology, he'll always go like, I don't know. We don't know. We're not sure. This is weird. Like, it is weird technology. We don't actually have to be experts. What we can do is we can build our capacity and start understanding the capabilities and limitations. So hopefully this helps a little bit by you do not need to drink directly from the host. And instead, we can work together. You can have experts, conversations. You can hang out with me. This, I am actually really boring, everyone. This is all I think about. Like, you know, six months, so it's only AI all the time. But you don't have to do that. So what we're gonna look at is some opportunities. So we have opportunities both for students and teachers. We're gonna start with educators because I think that this is the thing that I love so much about what we get to do is that I get to go around the world, mostly on Zoom <laughs> and also in person like today, where I get to teach people about generative AI and how it can support their practice. Because one of the most amazing things in here is that it can help you do your job better and quicker. Who here spends five hours a week outside the classroom doing administrative work? Can you raise your hands? Who here spends 10? Okay, whose day starts on Sunday night and not Monday morning? Okay, and so this is something that we know, that we have, I've got a superintendent here, it's not his fault exactly, but like we put a lot on our teachers, right? <laughs> I. <laughs> I am not being paid, so I can say these things, I'm joking. Um, no, but I mean, we, it's, it's a hard job, and in fact, it's become harder, right? Being a teacher has only become harder. One of the most things I'm most excited about is actually, this is an opportunity to make things better for once. Like, I'm so excited about being able to say that, and I can tell you 
you know, I started AI for education because I hate rubrics. I hate writing rubrics. It sounds silly, but it's something I did as both a teacher and as someone in business. And I really found it, it was a struggle. It took a lot of time. And honestly, I didn't do them very well. I always forgot to change any to then or none or whatever. Messed it up every time. And so the first thing I ever asked ChatGPT to do was to write me a rubric. And when it wrote me a rubric and it formatted it as a table, I started AI for Education, and that is not a joke. Because I realized two things at the same time. I realized that this was a transformational technology we've been talking about for 20 years. This was the possibility. This is the foundation for true transformation. But it's something that's not quite there yet, and we have a lot of room to go to actually adopt this. So some ways in which we can think about how to support you. The first is to help you automate admin, to make it easier. If you really do not like creating exit tickets, I don't know, like, do you know you're really good or questioning? I was really terrible at questioning when I first started teaching. Help me write critical thinking questions or a rubric or an exit ticket. If I'm a leader in this room and you have to think about newsletters and updates to parents and maybe responding to an email where you're not snarky because it's been a really long day and that parent is a pain in the butt. Like, there are ways to do this and actually have support. And we can do this where the 80-20 rule comes to life. You put 20% of the effort in to get 80% of the output. So that's number one. And hopefully you've done this, whether you've done this on your own. Okay, honest time. Who in here has not used ChatGPT? Okay. My challenge to you all is that you use it before you leave today. We had a session earlier, and it was great. It was a room full of people never using it. It's a safe space. I'll come sit with you. We're doing policy later, but I will come sit with you during the break, and we'll do it together. But try it out. See how it can provide value to you. The second is it's a great thought partner. OK, everybody, we're really bad at naming things at AI for Education. That's why my company's name is AI for Education. Um, true story. Um, and so how do I use AI? We used it to come up with this title, <laughs> you know? Like, it's, it's something, it's a thought partner. I might, like, you know, Dan and I can go back and forth forever, but we're gonna hit a, like, a block or a wall, and maybe he wants to stop talking to me, because he has to talk to me a lot. But what I can do is I can ask ChatGPT, I can upload this, you know, the presentation we created, and then get feedback, and it can give me 50 to 100 different ideas. It is meant to be a thought partner. They're not gonna be perfect, and we didn't use one that came from it. But we have this idea of like being able to do that. And I'm running out of time. <laughs> so for students, we also see that there's an opportunity for a lot of things, including being a thought partner and having personalized learning. This is the thing I'm most excited about. And I told this story earlier. But using ChatGPT to help you with an exit ticket, one of my, the teachers that I was working with came out with very, used one of our prompts from our prompt library. And she came out with five great prompts. And her response was not, I'm going to pick the best one. It was, I'm going to give my students all five. And they're now going to have a choice of how they show their learning. So it's something I've always cared about doing, but I never have enough time. So the idea of personalization. We also see accessibility. So students with dyslexia or have difficulties with, with low vision, no vision, ChatGPT is voice on your phone. You never have to type. In fact, you can spell everything wrong, pretty much, and ChatGPT will understand. So before we go on to the call to action for today is that we cannot, again, this is brand new technology. There are key limitations that we have to consider, OK? We cannot leave this room without understanding that there are limitations. One is that they have limited knowledge bases, not only in terms of time, meaning that ChatGPT 4 now is cut off at April 2023. It does not know that Travis Kelsey and Taylor Swift are dating. It will, t it will make that up, though. If you ask, it will, that last one, that prone to hallucinations, because it's not thinking, it's predicting, and it wants it to be right, it'll make stuff up. It'll give you an answer, regardless if it knows or not. So we want to do that. Limited knowledge bases also means that like, it doesn't have access to everything, like a oral tradition. It doesn't have access to a lot of training data from other cultures and languages. And that leads to bias in the training data. I hate to break it to you. We are a biased society, and guess what? Who builds these tools? We build these tools. Our biases are part of these tools hugely. OK? We are talking global north. I, I think ChatGPT is biased, American biased. And so we have to be careful to make sure that we are teaching and learning about the capabilities and limitations. So we're not just saying, go do, 
but like how do we use these tools effectively and ethically? So last three minutes, I have three key actions. This is our theory of change as we're getting started. The first one is to learn. You're here today. Thank you. Thank you, everyone being here. You're doing the first thing already. See, you're already halfway there. Well, a third of the way there. This idea of building AI literacy for yourself and then bringing it back to your school community is my number one thing that we talk about every day. I'm gonna get it tattooed or put it on a pillow or something. It's gonna just be like building AI literacy. It is the number one thing that is so important. If you don't start using these tools and understanding their capabilities and limitations, you're going to be left behind. And you're, more than that, your students are going to be left behind. You know what is a staggering thing I hear every day? is that there are students that are avoiding using these tools to even help them study because they are afraid of being told that they are cheating. They are avoiding these tools that could help them prepare for a college essay, to help them study for a test, because they are afraid that they are gonna be accused of cheating. And I was even in a room with superintendents and one of his children had been accused of cheating, a superintendent. So if we do not build AI literacy and start normalizing its use and understand how to teach students how to use these ethically and responsibly, it's going to put our students behind too. And that is a real question about equity and access. So please, don't worry about being an expert. Do not drink directly from the fire hose. That's why you have me. Follow me on LinkedIn. I drink directly from there. But the idea is to build your own capacity. The second is to experiment. Just try it. We did that today. Like I said, I will, I seriously, if you've never used it, come hang out with me. Try it, play around with it, try to break it. It's a lot of fun and it can be really weird. It can be really weird, but it can also be really amazing. And I think this is where it gets so exciting is that these tools are getting better and better every day and they're going to have so many opportunities to help you in your own practice. Even if you're just like, I really want to get into a workout regime. Use it for that. It doesn't have to be about school. It doesn't have to be about learning. But just get in there and be willing to fail, but I'd love you to be curious. The last one is to innovate. And we talk about this in the kind of like, you build your literacy, you then experiment, and then you innovate and take an innovative mindset. And the reason why we put it this way is that, by, like, you know, I don't think we're gonna have college essays in a couple years, at least not in the way that they are today. Because ChatGPT right now can write a better college essay than the college that is accepting it. <laughs> and so things like that are very common right now, all of our assessments almost completely are written based. And those, that is the same thing as saying that all of our technology, like all of our assessments were gonna be able to be done by a graph and calculator, which was never the case. But now really ChatGPT can do like at the same level, if not better as humans on written assessments. So we need to start thinking about what school becomes and what it looks like. And you guys have this opportunity to lead from the front like never before. You have an opportunity to start thinking about what is the replacement or the augmentation to a five paragraph essay, a lab report. Please don't make more worksheets. Please don't use AI to make more worksheets faster. How do we reframe that so it actually is meaningful for our students? So I think that, you know, this idea of a theory of change, I'm not asking you to start here. I'm asking you to start at building your own literacy, learning, and sharing. Next is to experiment, and then finally is to innovate. So what I'm gonna do is we're gonna kind of take it from here. We're doing some sessions later if you wanna connect, but I'm actually gonna call up a panel. So I have two teachers and two students that are gonna come hang out with me.